and welcome to the broadcast. I'm Steve Lubetkin. For seven decades, the former Siba Geige Chemical Company site in Toms River, Ocean County, New Jersey, has been a poster child for bad environmental behavior. Even back when I was a young radio reporter working in Asbury Park in the 1970s, I remember reporting stories on the pollution there. The chemicals fouled the groundwater that fed drinking water wells used by residents, and the dumping is suspected of causing hundreds of cases of rare cancers among residents, including cancer clusters involving children and babies. Siba Geige was later acquired by German chemical company BASF, which inherited responsibility for cleanup of the Toms River site. The site was officially declared a Superfund site by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 1983. It's been under government supervised remediation ever since, and that's likely to continue for decades to come. But some parts of the cleanup have reached the point where BASF and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection have come to an agreement on a proposed restoration of undeveloped portions of the site. DEP announced the plan in December 2022. It involves restoration efforts on about 1,000 acres of the site that would restore them for use by residents as a nature preserve and environmental education center. In a town that was systematically deceived about illegal dumping on the property by the site's owner for decades, it's no surprise that residents are skeptical of any official pronouncements about the site. Residents of Toms River were particularly angry that the proposed settlement was announced with little or no local input, and so about 200 Toms River residents demanded more transparency from the state DEP at what turned out to be a four-hour-long town hall meeting March 13th. Sean Moriarty is the deputy DEP commissioner and opened the meeting by noting his own personal ties to Toms River. Now I tell you this, not so you'll agree with me or agree with the department on the settlement. I say this only in the hope that you'll believe that I wouldn't stand here tonight in front of a place that I still say that I'm from if I didn't personally believe in the settlement that the department is proposing to achieve restoration for natural resource injuries at the Sipagaki site. If I didn't believe that the permanent preservation of 1,000 acres of developable land at the site of a groundwater injury with nine integrated restoration projects to address additional ecological injuries that will turn a long-standing environmental liability into an environmental asset squarely meets our constitutional duty to protect and restore the state's natural resources and is ultimately a good deal for the people of Tom's River. The Natural Resources Damages Settlement is not based on a financial figure. The DEP officials explained at the meeting they use a model to calculate the damages based on how much land needs to be restored to repair most of the damage, not a dollar amount. Nevertheless, Moriarty acknowledged that residents are interested in understanding how the settlement might stack up in terms of its dollar value. Here's what he said about that. We do believe it's worth noting the financial aspects of the proposed settlement. An analysis of comparable sales reveals that the, that the development value of the property is in excess of $200 million. And the cost of implementing, I see you laughing, I understand. The cost of implementing the restoration projects is around $30 million. With that said, we're not here tonight to advocate for our position. We're here tonight to provide you with, with transparency and empathy, the information and perspective necessary to allow you to draw your own conclusions. Then he went into a more detailed explanation about what a natural resources settlement actually involves. The goal of natural re resource restoration is to ultimately provide equivalent compensation for injuries to natural resources like groundwater, surface water, and habitat, and considers the, the extent and duration of the injury. Now this assessment necessarily comes at the tail end of the remediation process when, information, when the necessary information has been developed. In analyzing that information, we're required to draw, at times, difficult distinctions between what we think we know and what we can prove, with the latter serving as the basis of our decisions. Where that distinction is relevant here is as we consider groundwater injuries, which are more, we are more, able, more easily able to quantify, and ecological impacts, like discharges to the Toms River and the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean, which we know occurred 
but we lack the same type of information necessary to fully quantify those injuries. That's why I consider it helpful to think of this settlement in two parts. First, to address the groundwater injuries, we're proposing the on-site preservation of 1,000 acres, or approximately 80% of the 1,200 acres that our models show would, would lead to the, to the um, full compensation for those injuries. The second aspect, the nine integrated on-site ecological restoration uplift projects with public access largely provided in previously undeveloped areas there was a bit of confusion among meeting attendees about the difference between the work that's being done to clean up the pollution on the site and the natural resources damage settlement. The cleanup or remediation is being done under the supervision of the DEP and the US EPA. The settlement is an opportunity to get additional restoration done to make the land usable again. Here's DEP Assistant Commissioner David Hames who is responsible for contaminated site remediation and redevelopment. We're going to distinguish between remediation goals and uh, natural resource damage goals. Remediation goals are based on health-based standards and ecological health-based standards, human health-based and ecological-based standards. Uh, the, they may be done, a, any remediation may be completed in terms of meeting our health-based and eco-based standards, but they will still be required to continue on with their natural resource restoration efforts. The settlement also calls for nine proposed conservation projects on the site, including a wetland buffer, a grassland pollinator habitat, habitats for the northern pine snake, bats and turtles, forest restoration, and an environmental education center. Here's what Deputy Commissioner Moriarty had to say about that. Those, those projects are intended to provide additional compensation for the ecological injuries we are less able to quantify. So take the, taking those numbers together, along with the estimated $300 million in remedial costs, the total costs of this, of this project, while an imperfect measure of sufficiency, are around a half a billion dollars for the site. Lastly, we empathize with those that feel the proposed settlement is not enough, that it's incomplete because it can't address the personal injury and losses that some folks have suffered. But we do want to ensure that folks understand that this settlement in no way affects those remedial obligations. BASF remains, li remains responsible for full remediation of the site, and nothing about this settlement affects anyone's ability to bring an individual claim for any harm that they've suffered. Britta Forsberg is the executive director of Save Barnegat Bay, an environmental group that's been tracking the Seba Geige cleanup as part of its overall efforts to protect the environment around the Toms River area. She challenged some of the proposed settlement provisions. The fundamental premise for NRD restoration projects is that they must provide some measurable and permanent ecological uplift for the environment, such as benefits to groundwater, surface water, and wetlands, and benefits for wildlife such as birds, snakes, and turtles, and also for the betterment of all people. To be successful, NRD projects must also recognize and account for past human activity that has already ruined the ecological conditions in the area. And NRD projects must recognize and account for how planned future human activity in the area may prevent planned ecological improvements. If these negative offsets are not recognized and accounted for, then the advertised ecological uplift in the NRD projects may be unrealistic and also unsupported by science. This room is filled with people who have common sense. In addition, we have spoken to experts in the field of NRD restoration. The NRD restoration projects proposed in the BASF settlement agreement do not make sense and they do not appear to be supported by science. Let me get into some specifics for why we think that may be true. Number one, the site was a huge chemical company that ruined much of the natural ecology and wildlife that once existed there. This site has been and continues to be polluted Superfund site that has been undergoing soil and groundwater remediation for almost 28 years to date. Remediation work continues to this day and that remediation work requires groundwater treatment equipment, piping and people walking about. The remediation plan here is to leave the polluted landfill along with other areas with contaminated soil where previous wastewater treatment occurred on site next to the lined lagoon. 
to leave polluted groundwater on site, and to use engineering and institutional controls to protect the public from that pollution. The Plan A NRD restoration plan in the settlement agreement calls for the following elements. Area 1 is a 535 acres of pre-existing forest that will be kept as a forest. Area 2 is 255 acres where an environmental center with trails will be constructed. And Area 3 is 210 acres of pre-existing solar panels that will be kept as a solar field. All of these acres will be restricted by conservation easements. Sprinkled among these areas are supposed to be various natural resource restoration projects intended to enhance grasslands, wetlands, rainwater infiltration, endangered species habitats, and to provide a public conservation center, walking trails, and observation areas. You are concerned that the construction of all of these restoration elements on an existing Superfund site may not be feasible or work out as they are envisioned. As such, you have built into the settlement agreement a Plan B restoration plan. Plan B provides that if Plan A is not feasible, BASF must provide DEP with other on-site or off-site NRD restoration projects. However, the public has no idea what those new projects might be, or if the public will even be told about them or have an opportunity to comment on them. You are also concerned that there may be no other reasonable I'm sorry, you are also concerned that there may be no other reasonable Plan B NRD restoration projects for the site itself or the surrounding area. As such, you have built in Plan C into the settlement agreement. If on-site and off-site NRD restoration projects are not feasible, then BASF must write a check to the DEP. It seems likely that Plan A and Plan B may not be feasible because Tom's River has prohibited conservation easements in the industri on industrial property like the BASF site, which appears to prevent BASF from executing Plan A or Plan B. That means the NRD settlement here may default to Plan C, write a check. The problem with Plan C is that the DEP has not told the public how much that check would be, where or how those funds would be used by the DEP, or how the DEP will calculate out that amount. The DEP has also not provided the public with a calculation or estimation of the natural resource damages here. As such, we have no idea how much damage we are actually talking about. DEP has also not provided the public with evaluation of the Plan A NRD restoration plan, or a description or evaluation of Plan B restoration plan. So we have no idea if the value of the restoration from either of these plans comes close to the value of the natural resource damages. The conservation easements included as part of the settlement agreement were supposed to include a present conditions report. This report was supposed to describe the natural resource values and existing conditions of Plan A, and it was supposed to include various reports, maps, photographs, and other documents that would explain and support the NRD valuation and NRD project restoration values. However, you failed to include the attachment to the settlement agreement, and you have refused to provide us with the information despite repeated requests. Putting aside these failings and omissions, and just looking at the restoration projects proposed in Plan A, the NRD restoration projects are unrealistic from a legal or scientific point of view. Calling a pre-existing 200-acre solar field a protected conservation zone does not work because according to the conservation easement law in NJSA 13,8, I'm sure you know the section, a conservation zone cannot have any surface construction on it. Even if it could, there is no evidence to support the claim that these solar panels will promote local species. For example, claiming the northern pine snake will benefit from grass around solar panels does not work because these snakes live in a forest. That is why they're called the pine snake. Using a lined lagoon with a deteriorating plastic liner does not work as a wetland habitat because once the liner fully deteriorates and needs replacement, the wetlands upon which any uplift credit would be ruined. The watercourse element originating from the extraction, treatment, and discharge of contaminated groundwater is not permanent because it will dry up when the discharged water, wastewater stops flowing and the purported habitat uplift will simply go away. Building an education center with trails that will cut off the movement of animals and spook them does not promote wildlife habitat uplift purported. Claiming the projects will enhance stormwater infiltration does not work because most areas with 
with impervious cover like solar panel footings, groundwater remediation equipment, monitoring wells, and piping are not being removed. And most other areas do not have impervious surfaces to begin with that need to be removed. So there is no stormwater infiltration enhancement. Claiming existing forested areas or ecological enhancements does not work because the forest already exists and they are not being enhanced. Claiming the area that is supersaturated by decades of groundwater discharge of up to a million gallons per day of treated wastewater will somehow dry out enough to revert the area to a forest by doing nothing to encourage that transformation is just simply not realistic. Building NRD restoration projects on top of a Superfund site where pollution will be left behind exposes animals to pollution, which is another debit to the claimed NRD restoration benefits identified here. Proposing habitat restoration projects do not address the real injury here which is the ongoing and perpetual groundwater injury. Posting an operation and maintenance fund for only 10 years is unrealistic because the restoration elements in Plan A must be maintained for much longer to actually realize the uplift purported, presuming that they were legally and scientifically practical to begin with, which they are not. Even if Plan A restoration projects were feasible, which they are not, and even if they could be preserved in perpetuity using a conservation easement, which is not possible given the recent Toms River zoning, Amendment, the conservation easements do not advance the goals claimed by the DEP. As you might expect, Commissioner Moriarty disagreed with some of her comments. I certainly do not think we agree um, with the characterization of those projects as being valueless. Um, I think contained within the settlement are contingencies to address um, situations in which those projects cannot be accomplished. I would not take that as an indication that we think they cannot be, um, but rather an, an effort to provide levels of accountability in exchange for the potential release that BAS would get, BASF would receive under the proposed settlement. David Bean from the DEP's Office of Natural Resources Restoration says the DEP's intention has always been to develop the restoration project with input from the public. Our intention is, is to develop the nine concepts that you've seen here tonight, to develop them design them and implement them with public engagement sessions. The intention is not to go to plan B. It's there in case we have to. I, we've done enough projects in our office where we know that, that what you envision sometimes isn't always possible uh, to actually pull off in the state that it was envisioned. And in those cases, it just makes sense to be able to, to transition to another project that provides, that provides equivalent ecological uplift. Uh, that's what's in the settlement. And yeah, Plan C, if nothing is possible, then there is a provision in there for them to provide funding. And then the responsibility is DEPs to go out and find a, a, a project that provides the kind of uplift uh, to the resources that impacted that we're looking for. That's in there. And that's, that's not something that's, that was trotted out for this case uh, specifically. We've done that in other cases. And that's just because when you have projects that are at the concept level, they need to be developed and it doesn't always happen in the way that you think it, it will. So that, those are just options in the settlement agreement. BASF doesn't get their release unless they build projects that properly offset the injury that we've calculated. When Tom's River Mayor Mo Hill got up to comment on the presentation, things got a little heated when he criticized State DEP Commissioner Sean LaTourette for not attending the meeting. I want to thank the NJDEP staff for attending tonight, although I have to admit I'm a little disappointed that Commissioner Sean LaTourette's not here. If you're a leader, you show up in the good and the bad. And I think, I think you have been disserviced by your leader for not showing up. I, saved 35, I saved, served 35 years in the military. And I didn't duck any assignments. And he sure ducked this one today. There are many forms of leadership. Um, I would not take the commissioner's um, trust in his staff as being any indication that he does not fully believe in what we are doing here tonight. Um, this is not a matter of folks hiding from bad. In fact, we believe this is a good settlement as, we, as we've um, explained today. But we are here to hear from you. We are not here to tell you anything. We are here to hear from you. And the commissioner's absence is no indication um, of anything other than his trust in us and us as leaders and a desire to provide an opportunity for the folks who do this every day on the ground in detail 
to speak with you. And when the mayor again questioned the absence of Commissioner La Tourette, Moriarty defended the DEP's presence at the meeting. I appreciate your, your, your perspective on that. I am the deputy commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. I am the second ranking official in a major state organization that employs almost 4,000 people. There, I am a leader, as the commissioner is. He is not hiding. He asked me to do this. I have a great deal of personal interest in this project, as I described earlier. So I'd appreciate it. You've had your time. Thank you. The town hall panel also heard from Christine Gertain, a high school science teacher and director of authentic science research at Tom's River High School North. Gertain is also the 2022-2023 New Jersey State Teacher of the Year. She said the township should have been included in the settlement discussions with BASF. We haven't had a say in our future and who we're being paired with. Uh, and that when someone came to you to that table to have a meeting about our future that we should have been at, at that meeting uh, and not afterwards informed. Gertain also asked the DEP to ensure that the full story of the site's pollution is told at the Environmental Education Center to ensure that the history of the site is remembered. People know what happened at Pearl Harbor and they know what happened at 9-11 and we just want to make sure in any plan that goes forward uh, that they're at the Environmental Center that hopefully will be a, a STEM center in the future for students to do many different things at, uh, that the students want to know that leaving the SEPA site better than we found it would include detailed information and stations that describe what pollution was done on each site on all the pieces of the property, uh, what the land can be used for, you know, post remediation, and what the land cannot be used for because of the damage that was done to that land in maybe those specific sites. We think that would be important to put up there um, because the Native Americans say to think about what is best for seven generations to come. And after we're long dead, we need to make sure that the public has been informed about what has happened at this site and that they are still having the information that's been put there publicly for people to see so that our children's children know what happened there and they don't forget and they don't misuse that for something that it possibly can't be used for in the future. In an emotional moment, Gertain also called for a memorial for Tom's River children affected by a cancer cluster in the township that was believed to have been caused by the chemical pollution. I've also been asked to reiterate that a memorial to the children and the families that were involved be put there someplace. Doug O'Malley from Environment New Jersey called on the officials to ensure that BASF doesn't get any unusual benefits from the settlement. A, a reference to Sibagaygi and the pollution that, that was allowed was a golden ticket for pollution. And that couldn't be more true. And that's obviously what you're hearing tonight too, is that there was anger over the golden ticket that was given. Obviously part of the anger too is that this settlement feels like it was fait accompli. And so what we're hearing tonight is hopefully an acknowledgement that this settlement is not a golden ticket. The settlement will change because of the comments that DEP is hearing, the comments that will be already submitted, and the comments that will be submitted. And so I'd strongly encourage the DEP to ensure that there is a golden ticket, not just a conversation, but to altering the deal on the table right now. Tom's River Mayor Hill summed up the community's unhappiness with the settlement process. We were never involved in the negotiations on this natural resource damage settlement. We were lectured to. We never saw the natural resource damage assessment in dollars and cents regarding the environmental damages done to the soil and groundwater. It doesn't begin to compensate the community and the individual victims and their families for what they've for who have suffered the most. Tom Zerver is known for two things nationally. Whenever I traveled in the Navy, I always heard about the 1998 Little League World Championship team. <clears throat> Great source of pride for this community. The other one, not so much. It's the book, Tom Zerver, which explains the story of the largest Superfund site in New Jersey one of the largest Superfund states, Superfund sites in the nation. And finally, the mayor says the 250 acres the DEP left out of the settlement should be turned over to the town as partial restitution. 
BASF, just like Sibagaiki, is playing us once again with this settlement. Let's not let the history repeat itself again. Enough is enough. This is a bad deal. At the very least, this proposal, this great proposal, a great deal, should be amended to deed the 250 acres to Tom's River as open space in compensation for the environmental and economic damages done to our community. The proposed settlement is in a 60-day comment period that currently ends on April 4th. You can get more information or comment on the proposed natural resources settlement on the New Jersey DEP website at dep.nj.gov slash BASF. If you have comments or suggestions for us about this program or our other reports, please email me at steve at statebroadcastnews.com. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.